so chemical uh, reactions and equations is the is your first chapter uh, in chemistry uh, you know for grade 10th uh, and it's been a while that we have looked at it so it's a good idea to really skim through the topics and look at different concepts uh, that are involved in this chapter so that we can understand how do we present them as an uh, answer writing skill as well as uh, the problems that this chapter has how do we really solve them so uh, we will begin with understanding what chem chemical reactions are uh, so chemical reactions basically uh, 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 chemical reactions basically is a process uh, in which one or more substances get converted into different new substances now when we say new substances uh, they essentially have two distinct properties one is their chemical properties change and as well as their physical properties change so uh, when these two properties change, we, we obviously uh, have a new substance produced uh, and the process which makes these new substances uh, produce is called as a chemical reaction. Um, the common examples of chemical reactions uh, involve burning gasoline, uh, baking cake at, at our house, you know, even breathing. So respiration is also a, a chemical process that we have. Now, uh, uh, what are the different, uh, 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 the, all of these reactions involve two basic categories of substances. Uh, so one is a reactant. So reactant is something that is getting changed uh, and reactants get changed to products. So whatever you, uh, uh, whatever substances actually uh, get uh, uh, converted or uh, they lose their original form, uh, they are called as reactants. And uh, what they get converted into are uh, products so a substance that enters into a chemical reaction uh, is react uh, is a reactant and serves uh, the substance that is produced by a chemical reaction uh, is actually a, a product uh, so uh, now that we understand what chemical reactions are uh, let's look at uh, what basically uh, yeah uh, uh, what are the reasons for these chemical reactions uh, some of the reasons for chem this this chemical reaction is uh, uh, basically the arrangement of electrons in an atom. Uh, we all know that uh, all of these uh, uh, chemical reactions happen because uh, the atoms in the molecule uh, are basically striving to achieve the octet, uh, which is the nearest inert gas configuration. So if you have eight electrons in your outermost shell, then you are a stable molecule. If you don't have, then you'll either lose electrons, you'll either gain electrons, or you'll share these electrons to form the molecule that is uh, uh, or for, to form to get the octet and therefore form a molecule uh, for the same. So therefore, what are the reasons of chemical reactions? Uh, the first reason is uh, the atoms with a full set of electrons do not form bonds, but uh, the atoms with incomplete set of valence electrons form bonds. Now, a common mistake is between valency and valence electrons. Uh, valency is basically a, the number of electrons that is either gained. Uh, so number of electrons that we gain that we either lose or that are shared by the atom to form a bond okay to form a bond now this is the valency valency is number of electrons gained or or, or lost or shared okay uh, but valence electrons means number of electrons in the outermost shell okay so to to uh, outermost shell so to give you an example when we say that the number of electrons in the outermost shell is 5, uh, then the valence electrons is 5. Okay, so this is the number of valence electrons. But the valency will be uh, minus 3. Why minus 3? Because it needs 3 electrons to be taken in, uh, which will make the chemical bond formed. So remember the difference between valency and valence electrons. It's a common mistake that people interchangeably use this. And you find that uh, there, is, there is a problem uh, you know, uh, in, in writing an answer. So the reasons of chemical reaction is whether it will form a new bond uh, and uh, which atoms will actually uh, break their original bond. Uh, so so uh, these two actions may actually make a chemical reaction proceed. Now, what are chemical equations? So chemical equations are uh, 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 chemical reactions represented by sentences. Okay. So when I say uh, sentences, they are uh, normal English language sentences as well as sometimes uh, with uh, mathematical symbols like plus uh, and an arrow. Uh, we will look at both of those. So uh, a chemical equation basically identifies the reactants and products in a chemical reaction. Uh, let's look at how. Uh, whenever a chemical process happens, then one or more substances are changed into one or more different substances. So it's generally a trend, a, a natural 
convention where we write reactants on the left hand side and products on the right hand side so uh, whatever is on the left hand side is taken as substances that are undergoing a change and products are those substances which will be formed as a result of this change now this the, the very process of writing reactants with an arrow to products is what we call as a chemical equation uh, this equation shows uh, multiple things firstly it shows what changes have taken place so what substances were originally and what happened as a new uh, substance the second it also shows uh, what are the relative amounts of various elements and compounds that have taken part in these reactions so uh, when I, when we say relative amount this relative amount can be expressed in terms of weight uh, or what we generally call as mass uh, it can also be expressed in terms of volume uh, it, it can be expressed in terms of uh, the moles which is the stoichiometric coefficient uh, so how many number of particles uh, have really taken part so all of these together uh, represent uh, what are the amounts that uh, the elements are really reacting with and in what proportion they are produced as a part of products. So this is this is one of the uh, merits of writing a chemical equation uh, uh, for a chemical reaction. Uh, let's look at some more properties of chemical equations. So uh, whenever we write a chemical uh, uh, equation, the starting substances, uh, as I mentioned, are reactants, uh, and the uh, end product is products. So when we write these uh, uh, chemical equations, you'll realize that either a single reactant or multiple reactants are separated by an arrow to give a single product or multiple products okay so uh, uh, the reaction can give any number of uh, uh, products uh, or it can use any number of reactants to give the final uh, outcome uh, now let's look at uh, uh, what are the parentheses that we really look uh, uh, you know noted here in terms of g uh, or you know you might have uh, different other symbols for example l s a q so all of these actually represent the physical state so there are some important rules of writing a chemical reaction. The first rule is, of course, the chemical formulae uh, for the molecules should be correct. So for example, when we write water, it is H2O, or when we are writing nitric acid, it is HNO3. So in all of these situations, the valency and the correct molecular formula is very important to be uh, written. Uh, we have seen how to write atomic symbols as well as molecular formulas uh, in, in previous chapters. So uh, the, uh, that, that's, uh, that's something that is that uh, we are assuming that we already are aware about. Uh, having said this, uh, when we write these chemical formulas, I'm going to take an example, for example, uh, carbon uh, plus oxygen O2 gives CO2, a very simple equation that we are going to look at today. Uh, so in carbon, we will we'll realize that we, we end up writing an S, in oxygen, we end up writing a G, and in CO2 also, we end up writing a G. Uh, this technically means that carbon is in a solid state oxygen is in a gaseous state and carbon dioxide is also in a gaseous state. I'm going to take one more example for the same. I'm going to take carbon monoxide so that we are able to see some more details on, on the chemical reaction. Everything remains the same except for the chemical formula where it becomes CO and you write this as gaseous. Now in this uh, entire expression, if you're writing an arrow, this basically means either an effervescence or a gas evolved. Uh, so upper arrows means uh, gas evolved and effervescence and they are uh, extremely important to write the upper arrows. The second thing that we actually have to uh, uh, remember, so this is an effervescence. Uh, now uh, effervescence mostly are given out during uh, solutions, but even if you are writing it uh, for uh, products that are in the gaseous form, uh, it is okay to mention an arrow uh, showing a release of a gas. Uh, the next thing is a deposition arrow, so where we will find that either a precipitate etc is mentioned. So writing all of these symbols of deposition and effervescence are critical. Writing the physical state is critical. Uh, so when you say S, it is actually in a solid state. Uh, when you say G, it is actually in a gaseous state. Please note that this S and G are uh, written as subscripts. So unlike uh, you know what you see in the PPT, uh, you know the subscripts are where uh, G and S you will find in in your general text. Uh, AQ generally means aqueous. Aqueous means the substance is dissolved in water. Uh, uh, please note that people generally confuse between uh, aqueous solutions, alcoholic solutions. So uh, when we write AQ, uh, it is especially when it is dissolved in water and nothing else. So if you are dissolving in some other substance like benzene or alcohols and all of those, uh, we do not write AQ. AQ is written only for water solutions. So uh, these are the four symbols that you will commonly find while you write any chemical equation and uh, uh, all the compounds uh, thus uh, formed are generally shown either released or 
uh, uh, you know, taken out. Uh, okay. Now, one more uh, very important aspect is to write the uh, chemical formula beneath the chemical reaction. So, for example, here it is it is it is a good idea to write as carbon, uh, oxygen, oxygen gas. In fact, you can mention very explicitly and uh, carbon monoxide gas. So uh, these are these are the ways that you actually should you know this is this is the way to really write a complete uh, chemical equation where you not only write the symbols but you also write the names of the uh, particular compounds and you uh, close all the chemical equations. So so that's uh, how you write chemical equations. One of the important factors that I have not yet mentioned is balancing the chemical equations, which will come in a in a in a few minutes. Uh, now, for example, this is a chemical uh, word equation where they have mentioned that calcium plus oxygen giving calcium oxide. The plus sign here means it reacts with. So at any point of time when you have a plus, sometimes you will find that calcium plus oxygen plus heat, you know, so which means that heat is actually taken in on the reactant side. And uh, if, if the same heat is written on the product side, it means that heat is evolved. So the plus sign here actually means it reacts with. Whereas the arrow means that it yields. Yields means it produces. Uh, uh, and, and it also shows the direction of the reaction. It, it means that it is going from these the reactant side to the product side. So anything that is on the arrow side is your products. Anything that's that's you know, you know behind the arrow sign is actually your reactants. Uh, now uh, let's look at how do how do we write a, a formula equation in much more detail. So firstly, we write all the symbols. And once we have written the symbols, the subscripts actually mention what balances you have. Uh, these are small things, but uh, you know uh, the common mistakes are the subscripts are sometimes confused with coefficients. So that is something that you have to avoid by writing answers. Uh, the subscripts are a part of the molecular formula, whereas coefficients are not. Coefficients show you the amount of the molecules uh, that are that are essentially uh, available for the chemical reaction. So uh, this is this is something that we have to keep in mind. So whenever someone gives you a word equation, word equation is may, means that uh, you are you are generally given an equation where uh, you have calcium plus oxygen uh, written as calcium oxide or or something like that. Then uh, the idea is that you write the symbols for it. For example, here calcium is written as Ca, oxygen as O2, and calcium oxide as CaO. Now uh, let's look further. Let's write a few chemical equations that uh, we have uh, for the uh, uh, you know. Uh, the the, the uh, statements that is given here. So uh, the uh, let's say we uh, the problem is silver nitrate reacts with copper. Now you will see that uh, there is a one or two mentioned here. These are oxidation states of that particular uh, uh, element. Okay. So for example, when we write silver, so the idea is that silver one means silver with a valency of one or oxidation state of one. Uh, and when we write silver nitrate. Nitrate obviously has one valency, so it has to be AgNO3. Now, uh, the, the practice problem mentions that silver nitrate is reacting with copper, so Cu, uh, to form copper nitrate, that is CuNO3. Now, please note copper nitrate, copper can also be of one oxidation state, in which scenario you end up getting a molecule of CuNO3, but it can also be of, uh, uh, you know, two oxidation state where you have Cu2, uh, which ends up giving you you uh, see cu no3 twice okay no3 twice right so both of these are uh, some some important uh, uh, you know uh, considerations so if a two is given please don't choose uh, an oxidation state that is not what uh, that is not relevant to us so in this scenario uh, what we'll do is uh, uh, we we will we will choose cu no3 twice and we'll write our uh, chemical equation so this will be cu no3 twice uh, plus it says silver right now please note in a word equation uh, nothing else about the physical state is mentioned so uh, you know it has to be assumed uh, what of these physical states would be uh, there are multiple ways to assume this one is most of the equations are actually mentioned uh, in your text so if you if you if you just go through these equations i think that's a good repository of uh, what uh, you know, equations you should know about but apart from that uh, uh, another clue, for example, I want to mention here is AgNO3 when it is uh, getting displaced by copper, obviously has to be in the dissolved form. So uh, the best idea is to write an aqueous here. Uh, copper, uh, obviously, copper uh, is in the in a, in its atomic form, so therefore it has to be a solid. CuNO3 now because it has been formed, uh, you'll you'll find that this is either in the dissolved form or it could be a precipitate as well. But uh, since Ag is getting uh, released, so I would 
uh, consider CuNO3 in the aqueous form and silver in the solid form. So you will find that uh, arrow here will make the best, uh, uh, you know, uh, case. So silver has to get deposited and uh, uh, it has to be written as a solid. So this is one of the very important uh, uh, aspects that we, uh, you know, uh, is, we have to remember while we write a chemical equation. Now let's look at uh, hydrogen peroxide where we have H2O2. Now H2O2 is going to decompose into water and oxygen. So all that has been given to us is that there is hydrogen peroxide which decomposes into H2O plus O2. Uh, now please note again in the above equation we have not yet balanced. So I'm just holding the balancing thing uh, for, for a few more slides so that we actually come to uh, understanding how we really do that from a, either a trial and error basis or uh, some other uh, equations. Okay. So now when we are looking at H2O2, uh, as it decomposes into water and oxygen, uh, you'll find that H2O2 is an aqueous solution. Water, this we will write as liquid because there is nothing like water dissolved in water. So you write this as liquid and oxygen gas would be evolved. So you write an arrow and you write this as gaseous form. Now, one important part of, uh, of this is it's also a good idea to write the names of chemical reactions beneath it, saying that this is hydrogen peroxide, uh, you know, this is... Uh, water and this is oxygen gas. So uh, this is a this is a complete way of writing a chemical equation uh, where you have written the states, you have you have uh, balanced the chemical reaction. Uh, here again, it is still not balanced. I'm coming there. I've repeated that twice. Uh, but you know, uh, balancing the chemical reactions, writing the arrows, uh, writing the names of the compounds, all of this has to be uh, taken care of. Uh, so coming back to our understanding of chemical equations, uh, now we will look at what do you really mean by balancing chemical equations. Uh, so a typical question uh, uh, that comes in balancing chemical equations is that uh, why do we balance chemical equations? Uh, it follows from our understanding of law of conservation of mass. So basically, uh, whatever has been put into the solution has to come out uh, because uh, the mass has to get conserved. So coming from the conservation of mass dynamics, uh, balancing of chemical equations is critical to write a completely uh, uh, fully explained chemical equation. So now let's take our all the examples that we have done. For example, when we wrote AgNO3 uh, uh, plus uh, Cu uh, to give CuNO3 twice because we were mentioned as Cu with a two oxidation state plus Ag, uh, we had also seen that AgNO3 was aqueous in nature, Cu was solid. CuNO3 further is aqueous in nature and Ag is solid. Now, in this scenario, we find that NO3 is not balanced. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll balance NO3 to put it twice here. The moment I balance NO3, you'll realize that uh, silver is now in excess. So you put two sign here. So, and here you will write a deposition symbol. So this is actually a complete chemical equation. Of course, you have to write the names like silver one nitrate, uh, it is a good idea to mention oxidation state as many times as possible. Uh, it gives a very clear cut idea to the reader uh, what uh, compound you're talking about. This is copper. Uh, you can mention this as copper. You can mention this as co copper 2 nitrate. And uh, you can also uh, look at uh, Ag as a solid deposition. Okay. So all of this actually uh, will help you uh, in understanding the chemical reaction. Uh, yeah, just, just a few uh, quick seconds. Right. Now, uh, coming back to, uh, uh, you know, balancing this uh, chemical reaction, we, we know that matter cannot be created or destroyed. So what are the number of atoms we have here? Uh, all of those atoms uh, have to be present in the product side. So and now there are a few rules that we would follow in, uh, in balancing this chemical reaction. Uh, for example, you know, the, uh, so, so basically the mass of the reactants and the products has to be same. Uh, that is why we balance chemical equations. And uh, for this mass to remain constant before and after the reaction, the number of atoms has to remain constant because we know that uh, the mass is proportional to the number of atoms, the quantity of atoms that we have, and therefore balancing both on the reactants and the product side, we'll balance the chemical equation uh, automatically. Yeah. So uh, let's look at a few more examples. Uh, let's let's say we have four hydrogen and one carbon. 
in, in one of the chemical reactions, then we will need four hydrogens and one carbon on the other side of the chemical reaction as well. So this is, this is yeah, important to have the same number of atoms on both sides of the reactants and the products. Now, uh, uh, how do we go about this process? Because, you know, uh, if we have a systematic idea of balancing a chemical reaction, then uh, it would be uh, ideal for us to do that uh, for any chemical reaction. So uh, uh, here are a few examples or steps that we can use to balance chemical reactions. So the first thing is whenever we write a chemical equation, determine the reactants and products, which would be pretty obvious from the arrow sign. Now, whatever are the reactants are written on the uh, LHS, as I mentioned, uh, the arrow actually means the yields, uh, yields or uh, as I mentioned, the what is produced and products on the right hand side. Now, uh, when we are balancing, the third step we, we would generally come to is uh, to count the number of atoms on both the sides and uh, see uh, which atoms are deficient. So, for example, in our, our case here, which is the simplest of the, uh, uh, you know, examples, uh, H2 uh, gaseous plus O2 gaseous giving H2O liquid. Yeah, in this, in this you will find that uh, uh, we have hydrogen, which are two on this side and two on this side, but oxygen are two here and one here. So, definitely we need to balance the oxygen. Uh, so, uh, we would put a uh, two here on, on this side so that oxygens are now balanced, but that makes hydrogen four. So, to balance hydrogen on the other side, you would multiply here again by two, which will make hydrogen into four atoms. So, now we have four atoms, two atoms, four atoms, and two atoms. Now, everything seems to be balanced. A few key things, you know. So, this is a very, uh, a very basic uh, example that we are looking at. But having said this, there are some important points that uh, uh, we have to really uh, remember. Firstly, balancing a chemical equation means only balancing the coefficients, okay? So we are only going to balance the coefficients. Never ever touch the subscript. If you are touching the subscript, it means that we are actually changing the uh, chemical uh, formula of the molecule and therefore a different molecule is what we are referring to, right? Now, uh, uh, the second most important thing is whenever we write this subscript, always remember that all of these subscripts are in the lowest possible ratio. For example, another way of balancing this would could be 4H2 plus twice O2 giving 4H2O, okay? Now, uh, if you really see, there are four hydrogens here, uh, eight hydrogens here, and there are eight hydrogens here. Uh, and there are actually uh, four oxygens here as well as four oxygens here. So it seems that this is a balanced chemical equation, but uh, the chemical equation is not in the lowest uh, ratio. And therefore, this would not be technically the best uh, uh, way of writing a chemical equation. So when you write a chemical equation, write them in the lowest uh, possible uh, ratio as well as uh, balance this equation using uh, the coefficients that uh, you can have uh, as minimal as possible. Uh, and, and do not change the subscripts, you know, uh, only change the coefficients. So this is a quick way of balancing a chemical reaction. Uh, of course, trial and error method is the best to do that. We'll look at a, a couple of examples now. Uh, so, for example, we have calcium plus oxygen uh, giving uh, CaO. So, uh, if you really see this, uh, you'll realize that it is not in balance. There are two oxygens on the left-hand side, but only one on the right-hand side. So, without changing the subscript, uh, so you, you, you don't go tomorrow to do it as CaO2. That would be, a, you know, just changing the molecule. In fact, nothing of that sort really exists. Uh, maybe some sup, uh, superoxides, but uh, that's not the way to do it. So what we really do is we, we put in a coefficient around calcium. Uh, so you'll realize that uh, we will write this as twice of Ca. Sorry. Yeah, you'll write this as twice of uh, Ca and twice of CaO. Uh, and therefore, now you find that both the oxygens are taken care of as well as calcium also are taken care of. Uh, these are called as stoichiometric coefficients uh, uh, in, in stoichiometric coefficients. Uh, uh, or in simpler terms, it's simply called as coefficients or in simple terms, it's only called as uh, 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 the coefficients of the reactants on uh, or the products. So, so this is this is a quick way of balancing a uh, chemical reaction. Now, uh, let's look at some, uh, some more equations. Uh, now, uh, let's say another example is given to you about methane plus oxygen giving carbon dioxide plus water. Uh, you'll find that uh, all of these can be written as chemical formulae. For example, CH4 plus O2 gives CO2 plus H2O. Now you will realize that is this balanced or not? The carbon, if you really look at the carbons, the carbon is one, one on each side. Uh, oxygen is, uh, yeah, there are two, here there are three. 
hydrogen here there are four and there is only two hydrogens here so so we will need to balance this chemical reaction and therefore uh, we will start balancing by looking at the number of atoms found in uh, uh, both of these so for example let's look at c carbon first ch4 plus o2 giving co2 plus h2o so so you will realize that uh, the carbon seems to have been balanced yeah uh, but uh, you know let's uh, you, you can begin with any of those you can either begin with oxygen or with hydrogen here it seems there are uh, four hydrogens so i will put in two more hydrogens here uh, so this this takes it uh, uh, two into two hydrogens become four uh, let's look at the oxygens there are two oxygens here and two more here so there are four, total four oxygens if i simply multiply this by two i end up getting four oxygens here as well as four here so all of these make sense and uh, uh, we have now everything balanced carbon balanced hydrogen and oxygen balanced there's another way to do this is you can actually make a table okay uh, an iterative table uh, where you can actually put uh, you know for example all the atoms to begin with so you say carbon you say hydrogen uh, you say oxygen and you can always put them into reactants and products okay so you can make two partitions to them and keep on writing it one by one so for carbon you can write this as one in reactant one in product for hydrogen to begin with there were four and there were two for oxygen to begin with there were two and there were three here so you make so you firstly you know this is cleared so you don't look at this you hydrogens there are four years so you simply make it four years so you multiply by two when you multiply uh, the uh, hydrogen on the uh, product side by two you suddenly realize that oxygen is two on this side but here it becomes four so as oxygens become four now you know what to do for the oxygen on this side so you can simply multiply this by another factor of two on the reactant side and you will end up getting four 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 and one one so this is another quick method uh, i think it's it's also a good method that you can quickly draw a, a a chart a box type of a system where you can simply start balancing these chemical reactions sure now uh, uh, from there let's look at some practice problems so we we had seen uh, water you know getting balanced but we'll also see maybe uh, you know c2h6 uh, o so this could be an ether this could be an alcohol so both of them c2h6 o plus o2 uh, giving co2 plus h2o so as we had mentioned quickly just write let's write the let me use a different color for that so what i'm going to do is i'm going to write the carbon uh, the hydrogens and the oxygens uh, any way of the table either horizontally or vertically uh, hydrogen and oxygens so carbon i know that there are two on the reactant side whereas there is only one on the product side uh, for hydrogens there are six on the reactant side but there are only two on the product side for oxygen you will see that there are three on the reactant sides and there are three on the product side so it seems that the oxygen is balanced but there is a huge gap between carbon and uh, uh, carbon and the hydrogens so let's look at first the hydrogen because this gap seems to be pretty really large so since there are six and two uh, i we would be happy to really multiply this by three so the moment i multiply this one by three you realize that uh, the hydrogens immediately gets balanced it's a six six balance uh, the second thing that you can look at is uh, what has happened to the oxygen. So the oxygen now are five in number on the product side, uh, but just about three in number on the reactant side. So uh, there needs to be something done. And the carbon is also to be balanced. So what we can go for the next is to really balance the carbon to make it two, two by multiplying the product side by a two. So now you have carbon as uh, two on both the sides, uh, but the oxygen has changed. So hydrogen has not touched, uh, has not been touched at all. Uh, but uh, oxygen now on the reactant side is still three on the product side it is four plus three seven so uh, uh, a good way to do this is now that we have seven you simply multiply the entire uh, uh, right hand side in on the oxygen side by a, a, a seven by two you know so now that we have three here out of three you take out one so you need only six oxygens here which can be multiplied very well multiplied by three and you can get an oxygen so now let's look at what has happened to the entire chemical reaction do we have two carbons yes we do have two carbons do we have six hydrogens on both the sides yes this is six and this is also six so we have six six hydrogens now let's look at the oxygen molecule we have six plus one seven this is four plus three seven so we do have seven seven oxygen molecules so the only thing that we really need to think about was how do i balance the oxygen we had an odd situation where it was three and seven uh, of course if you have just put in a three year uh, we already knew that one oxygen is is stuck with the C2H6O. So I can remove that oxygen. I needed six oxygens more. 
So the, by the moment I multiply it by three, I would end up getting oxygen as six atoms. Okay. So this actually uh, uh, balances the chemical uh, reaction. And you will realize that uh, the same is actually mentioned as the solution, right? Now, uh, let's look at maybe a few more. Yeah, so all of these are uh, practice problems, you know, as, as I do <coughs> along the side, uh, I would also request that you all uh, have and, uh, you know, all have a look at these uh, solutions and try to balance them. Let's look at zinc, zinc plus HCl giving ZnCl2 plus H2, okay? So here we again have, uh, yeah, we again have zinc balanced already. Uh, we have uh, HCl and chlorine not balanced. Uh, there are two hydrogens here, only one hydrogen. So let me multiply by two. So I have two hydrogens here. Now let's see about chlorine. So you have two chlorines here and two chlorines here. So everything seems to be balanced and the balanced chemical reaction simply needs a uh, two at the HCl side. Let's look at Al plus O2 giving Al2O3, okay? So Al plus O2 uh, gives Al2O3. Now in this scenario, I need two aluminum. So I'm going to just put in two here. Uh, there are two oxygens here and three here. Uh, so uh, basically I need three by two. Uh, I need this as three by two, but the moment I do this as three by two, it's it's actually in the fractional form. So a good way to do this is multiply the entire equation by another two. So you can write this as four Al plus three O2 giving twice of Al2O3, okay? So four aluminum is, is what we have had. This is six oxygen. Uh, you will find that four aluminum again is here and six oxygen is here. So this seems to be a balanced chemical reaction. Let's look at Al plus CuSO4. Yeah. Let's look at aluminum plus CuSO4 giving Al2 SO4 thrice plus Cu. Now you'll realize there that aluminum itself is not balanced. SO4 is not balanced even uh, just the copper seems to be balanced now so let's begin with balancing the so4 why because it seems to be uh, the furthest apart so so4 there is only one year and there are three in here so what you can do is you can multiply by three years so that means that so4 gets balanced the moment you have three the copper uh, also turns out to be three so copper also seems to be balanced now there are three copper here and three copper on the product side so4s have been balanced now only thing that is remaining is aluminium and you can do that by putting up a twice of aluminum here, okay? So this, this actually covers all the uh, segments of uh, uh, balancing uh, the aluminum reaction. Now let's look at the lithium uh, H2O reaction. So uh, we have Li plus H2O giving LiOH plus H2. Now in this scenario, the lithium is balanced already. Uh, we find that hydrogen is uh, uh, is twice here and there are three hydrogens here. So something has to be done about the hydrogen. Oxygen also seems to be balanced. So all we need to do is balance the hydrogen and for that, whatever else is required, uh, we will have to take that uh, and, and balance as well. Now, there are only two hydrogens here, but there are three. So uh, let me try and put in uh, a, fr a fractional balance. So that this is another good way to do that. This is just to be done mentally, not really in the exam because to get in by a trial and error method, sometimes it might be difficult. So since there are three here and there are two here, a good idea is to multiply this by a three by two so that this two and two cancels out uh, and you actually have uh, uh, three oxygens on both the sides. Now, but but since we cannot do and we cannot play with the subscripts as we have mentioned, uh, what we generally do is we'll multiply the entire equation by a two. So you end up getting two lithium plus three H2O giving twice of LiOH plus uh, twice of H2. Now let's look at if we have really got really got our uh, solution. So we have four hydrogen here and two hydrogen here. So total six hydrogens are present. There are also six hydrogens here. Lithium also seems to be balanced. Uh, oxygen, there are three here, uh, but we have only two oxygens here. So uh, oxygen is still not balanced. So we need uh, some more balancing uh, to be done here. So for oxygen to be balanced now, uh, there are three oxygens here and there are only two. So, uh, Okay, so twice, twice. So let, let's try and balance the oxygen for one more time. Yeah, so uh, maybe we can, we could just use a two in here and, and that should satisfy. 
So how many hydrogens do we have? Two and two, four. Uh, okay. So the other way is also to write this as Li plus uh, H2O actually gives out uh, LiOH plus H plus. You know, this is this is the first one. And then if we need to form an H2, uh, we will have to have two H2 hydrogens. So the entire reaction can be multiplied by, uh, you know, one more time. So LiOH comes in one more here. And you have H2O plus Li. So if you simply add these two reactions, you'll end up getting twice of Li plus twice of H2O gives twice of LiOH plus H2. This seems to be a very balanced reaction. Let's look uh, 2 into 2 hydrogen is 4. Uh, here also we have 4 hydrogens. We have oxygens that are also balanced 2, 2 and we have 2 lithiums balanced. So sometimes when you don't get it by a fractional uh, method, this is a good idea to actually find out what's happening inside the reaction. So I know that when LiOH is reacted, it will give out a hydrogen and I need two hydrogens to basically make uh, one H2. So this is another way to really do it by a trial and error method. So, so th there are multiple ways that you can actually balance the chemical uh, reaction. And as you balance these reactions, uh, you'll realize that, uh, you know, this is also a, a skill that you will need to develop. And uh, one way is, as I mentioned, so there are two couple of ways that we really saw. One way is simply writing the number of atoms on both the sides and looking to balance them. The second is actually to write partial reactions. So you can write a partial reaction here and try and balance them. Uh, the third way is to simply put in numbers, maybe put, put with a fractional one and uh, you, can, you can do that as well. Yes. So uh, uh, Ishan has, has been commenting, uh, sir, yes, we can do 2Li and 2H2. That's right, Ishan. Uh, uh, that's that's a good point, but but the idea is that you know uh, do we have a schematic method to do this? Uh, you know, can we really program this and have a uh, have a have a straight method to do this? Yes, we do have. So we have seen at three different methods: one by writing number of atoms and trying to balance them; second, writing in a fractional form. Sometimes when you are stuck in a fractional form, then the third method is that you actually see what are partial reactions and try to balance them. So this is this is one quick method. Uh, of balancing. Please note in this reactions, the reactions are not complete with, until you write the state, uh, you know, liquid here, uh, then this is also aqueous and this is actually gaseous uh, to show an arrow and to write the names of all the molecules at their bottom. So that, that completes the reaction. Uh, at some point of time, you'll also see that you write a heat here or uh, you'll write temperature simply 300 degrees Celsius. That gives us some additional information about what conditions do we really have, uh, have to do. Uh, uh, Ruchir is mentioning what was the last method. So the last method, uh, Ruchir, is I'm going to write that again for, for you just so that you have a, a bit more clarity is what really is happening in the reaction. So for, for example, when we write Li plus H2O, I know that when I say LiOH is happening, there must be a hydrogen that must be available, right? Because out of H2O, which is HOH, if I take out an OH, then we have a hydrogen remaining in the solution. So where does that hydrogen go? Now I know that this hydrogen is the one that is forming H2. So I need one more hydrogen to come out. So maybe this reaction is happening twice. So I can write it one more time saying that Li plus H2O gives LiOH plus another hydrogen. And then I can add them up to write this as twice of Li plus twice of H2O giving twice of LiOH plus H2 gas. Okay. So, so, that, so the, the, the last method is where we are writing this as uh, partial reactions. Yes, so we write them as partial reactions. Uh, basically, essentially, really trying to find out how the ions are getting exchanged inside the uh, reaction itself. Uh, what we are also going to see is the type of reactions, which is a part of our, uh, you know, uh, theory for forward. So uh, uh, that that's that's the idea to really use in while we are balancing these chemical reactions. Sure. So let's look at uh, some more practice problems where uh, uh, you know we are we are looking at. Uh, aluminum reacts with oxygen to produce aluminum oxide. So you can simply write this as Al plus O2 giving Al2O3. We have already balanced this previously. We know that uh, we write this as 3 uh, and uh, the moment oxygen is written as 3, this is this is as not not true, sorry. So this, this comes out to be uh, twice and twice here. Uh, so this would be 4 aluminum. So 4 aluminum plus, so we have 6 oxygen here, we have another 6 oxygen and we have 4 aluminum. So this actually does does uh, work. Uh, there are a couple of questions. Uh, so what is the state of Al2SO4 thrice in the third one? Uh, the state, see, in anything that is actually a, a, a dissolved solution would always have an aqueous state. So for example, in uh, Al2SO4 thrice, 
this would be in aqueous form. Uh, a key to really, uh, you know, know this is basically to see what its other product is. Now, since copper is the other product, we are sure that copper would be in the solid state and would be deposited. So if copper is getting deposited, then obviously the second component that it has would be a dissolved salt. And therefore, this should be in the aqueous form. So Al2SO4 thrice is an aqueous form. Uh, when 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 we'll we'll understand the higher chemistry, we'll also realize that uh, how, which sulfates and which phosphates are soluble. So the aluminium sulfate is a soluble one, and therefore you'll find that this is in the aqueous form, whereas copper in the is in the solid form. Right. So uh, uh, good question. I think that that explains uh, uh, this part. And then let's look at some more practice problems. We have already seen aluminium and oxygen one. Let's look at sodium nitrate and calcium chloride. Uh, producing sodium chloride and calcium nitrate. Another uh, quick easy one. So we will write this as sodium nitrate, NaNO3. NaNO3. Yeah, so this is NaNO3, sodium nitrate uh, giving, uh, pl sorry, plus calcium chloride, CaCl2, giving NaCl plus calcium nitrate. Now, please note, uh, calcium will retain its uh, plus 2 valency and therefore it is CaNO3 twice. Please do not make mistakes in writing the molecular formula. Uh, while we write the molecular formula, the valencies have to be matched. The valency of NO3 is minus 1, whereas calcium is plus 2. So this ends up being CaNO3 twice. So when you write this, now you re obviously you realize that sodium is balanced, calcium is balanced, but NO3 is not balanced, neither is chlorine balanced. So obviously, we need to balance this out. Uh, we have twice of NO3, so that, that gives us a hint that maybe putting two here uh, might balance ni uh, nitrate group, which is NO3. So obviously, now sodium is not balanced. Sodium is twice here and only one year. So I'll put in a two year. This automatically balances the chlorine part. So the chlorine is now balanced with uh, 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 you know two chlorines on both the sides, two sodium on both the sides, and two nitrates on both the sides, whereas calcium, one one on each side. So uh, this is this is sodium nitrate getting balanced. The last reaction is slightly tricky, and uh, a few of you had a question on how come nitrogen forms so many compounds. So you know I've involved a question on uh, nitrogen as well. So you can see the question mentions that dinitrogen pentoxide. Uh, by the very name, we know that when we say dinitrogen, it must have twice of nitrogen, and pentoxide means it must have five oxygens. This when it reacts with water gives nitric acid this is what is being mentioned inside the uh, yeah, in, in the chemical reaction now you'll realize that um, uh, obviously there are two nitrogens here and only one nitrogen here so one idea is actually to multiply that with a with a coefficient of two uh, once it is multiplied with a coefficient of two uh, we have twice of hydrogen so hydrogen seems to be balanced let's look at the oxygen uh, we'll find that six oxygen are here and here also it it, it turns out to be there are the six oxygens and therefore uh, this chemical reaction is balanced uh, pretty pretty easily now, one of the important things that we will notice in this chemical reaction is that uh, as we actually uh, uh, write the chemical reaction and uh, the, the most common doubts are uh, how we are going to write the uh, molecular formula of nitrogens. So you see nitrogen actually has five electrons in the outermost shell. Uh, there are multiple ways that nitrogen shares these five electrons with uh, other uh, atoms or other elements. So uh, the oxidation states that nitrogen shows are varied. So you can you have NO2, you have NO3, uh, you have NO, uh, then you have N2O5, right? In all of this, you will realize that nitrogen shares oxidation states uh, right from minus 3 uh, to up to plus 5, okay? Uh, so there are multiple oxidation states that nitrogen can show in, and therefore it, it, is, um, uh, it, is, it, is, it is what uh, shows you uh, the multiple various oxidation states of nitrogen. Uh, so, so uh, uh, one key thing that we need to remember here is that uh, nitrogen shares electrons, uh, 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 you know, without really co sometimes completing the octet as well. Uh, so th that's again beyond the scope of our current discussion. But uh, for example, when you look at NO, NO forms a nitrogen double bond with oxygen, uh, and you will realize that uh, here the octet of nitrogen is not really clearly uh, completed, right? So uh, you'll realize that uh, in N, uh, so there are multiple compounds that no, uh, nitrogen is able to form uh, uh, when we understand its orbital configurations, uh, which uh, uh, you know uh, makes us get get different compounds. So this is this is a, a quick uh, uh, you know look at uh, how to balance chemical reactions and some problems on chemical reactions. Now um, 
uh, let's look at uh, uh, writing a complete chemical. We have already seen this, but just to show you an example, uh, I have mentioned uh, you know methane plus oxygen uh, gives CO2 plus water. You will realize that it's a balanced chemical reaction with its states completely written. Uh, since the entire reaction is gaseous, I don't need to write any arrows of evolution. Uh, uh, the only thing that I might want to add is uh, writing the names of these uh, molecules. So, for example, I can mention sorry, yeah, for example, I can mention this as yeah, as methane. Uh, I can mention this as oxygen. Uh, I can, oxygen gas. In fact, you know, you should write it completely. Oxygen gas. Please do not uh, lazy around writing the uh, chemical uh, molecular formulas because these molecular formulas themselves will make sure that uh, you know you you get your full marks. Uh, this is this can be written as carbon dioxide gas. Uh, yeah, carbon dioxide gas, and uh, you'll have water. Uh, now, please note it is a water in the gaseous form, so it's it's a good idea to write it as steam, okay, steam, right? So all of this is 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 important to mention on the uh, chemical reactions wherever necessary. Good. So now let's go to the, the next part of this uh, chapter. So the, this chapter you will see is divided into four different parts, right? So just to give you a quick summary, uh, the first part actually deals with understanding. Uh, so, you know, you should have a chapter map before you whenever you are studying this chapter. The first part of this entire chapter deals with uh, what are chemical reactions and how to write them. Okay, chemical reactions as well as writing chemical equations. Okay, so that's the first part of uh, this chapter. Okay, the second part of this chapter is, uh, you know, uh, actually mentioning about uh, uh, what are the balancing of chemical reactions. That's a very important part. So, I, I, I tend to write it separately from chemical equations so the balancing part uh, balancing chemical equations and the third part of this chemical reaction is actually uh, the uh, of the entire uh, chapter is actually what are the types of different reactions so you can write uh, types of chemical reactions okay uh, and what are their examples etc and the fourth part of this chapter is uh, where you will study about a, a typical few reactions. Uh, for example, you have, uh, uh, you know, corrosion or you have rancidity for that matter, all of those parts, right? So uh, these are the four major, uh, you can say, uh, components of this chapter. Uh, so while you study, uh, please remember that you block your components in these four factors and you actually study them uh, effectively. Now let's look at, uh, uh, so we have, we have finished the first two components of this chapter. Now we are going to look at the third component, which is the types of chemical reactions. So let's look at uh, what are the different types of chemical reactions. Uh, the first one is what we call as combination reaction or uh, simply synthesis reactions. So we we call them as when when two uh, you know products get together. So let's look at a few combination reactions. So for example, when you have A plus B giving AB, uh, you will call this as a synthesis reaction. Okay. So in this reaction, you will find that two basic uh, elements are came, coming together to give you a, a, a bigger element, AB. Okay, so uh, uh, th this is where we say that you know two or more reactants come together to form a single product. Okay, so that's uh, that's a synthesis reaction. Uh, the second is uh, the product in synthesis reactions, or what we call as combination reactions. Uh, okay, the product is more complex. Uh, so in combination reaction, you'll find that the product is generally a complex product uh, than its elements. So AB, for example, is the complex uh, product that we are talking about. When we say complex, it basically means that there are multiple elements that are together uh, uh, forming the uh, com uh, compound rather than simplistic ones. So, uh, you know, for example, our, our very common example is H2 plus O2 giving H2O. So you'll realize that H2 and O2 are basically elements and H2O is actually a complex molecule, right? So H2O is a complex product. So, uh, so in synthesis reactions, products are always more complex than their reactants. Uh, this we call as the combination reactions. Uh, and more than two or more substances would combine to form one new substance. Okay, uh, the general form of these reactions is uh, either an element or a compound plus another element or a compound will always give a compound. Okay, please note I have not written element here because uh, you know it does not form an element. It forms only compounds. Okay. So uh, an element or a compound plus another element or a compound can give you another compound. Okay, so that's the general form of the combination reactions. Okay, and uh, that's that's what is required to uh, form uh, you know com combination reactions. 
Now let's 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 go further understanding these combination reactions. There are a few examples that you can see on the screen. So first example is you have uh, ammonia plus HCl giving NH4Cl. Uh, so this is basically you don't even need to balance this. It's already a balanced reaction. Most of the combination reactions you'll find that are generally technically already balanced. Uh, the second is a CaO plus SiO2 uh, giving you uh, you know CaSiO3. Okay, this is another balanced uh, chemical reaction. Uh, the other one is water plus oxygen giving H2O2. This is hydrogen peroxide. Uh, this is not uh, balanced without really adding a coefficient two. So uh, in some cases you'll have to balance them, but you can realize that you know you you have uh, hydrogen and oxygen giving out a molecule hydrogen peroxide, which is actually a balanced molecule, uh, uh, which is balanced by using a coefficient uh, two on both the sides. The next one is actually uh, sodium plus chlorine giving you NaCl. So these are all uh, different combination reactions, okay? Uh, and you will realize that you know uh, CO2 and H2O giving H2CO3 is another example. So there could be multiple examples. Uh, if, if you see all of these reactions are of the type A plus B giving AB, you'll realize that A or B most of the times are either an element or a compound. For example, in H2 plus O2, A and B both are element. Uh, in Na and Cl2, they are again in the elemental form. But uh, if you realize in NH3 and HCl, they are in the compound form. But if you look at AB, they are all compounds. Okay, they are all in the compound form. Uh, they are all in NH4, Cl, CIO, SI, CSIO3, H2O2. They are all complex compounds. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the way that you can actually look at uh, different uh, uh, you know combination reactions. Now let's look at uh, the next type. Uh, which is the decomposition reaction so decomposition by the very word it means that it is breaking down into smaller parts okay so uh, so essentially when you are looking at um, a, a, a compound which is very complex uh, it's basically a reverse of what we did in combination reaction so ab going to ab plus a plus b is actually a decomposition reaction okay so now here you will realize that uh, a single compound actually breaks down into two or more compounds okay uh, it, it is of the form where a complex substance gets down to simpler elements or simpler compounds. Uh, let's look at a few examples of uh, decomposition, uh, uh, you know, reactions. Uh, now, uh, uh, some characteristics of decomposition reactions is when a compound breaks apart, uh, it decomposes into simpler substances when energy is supplied. So this is an important factor that energy supply, uh, supply of energy actually gives you uh, decomposition reactions. Now, now, energy might be supplied in multiple forms. It can be supplied in terms of heat, in terms of light, in terms of mechanical shock or electricity. So there are multiple ways that you can actually have, uh, you know, the energy being supplied. But as this energy gets supplied, you will realize that the substance breaks down into, uh, you know, simpler substances. Uh, here is a general form of these uh, reactions that a compound actually gives two or more elements or uh, two or uh, more compounds, okay? Uh, let's look at a, sub, uh, a few examples. So you'll see that most of these examples are actually the reverse of your combination reactions. So for example, when you have H2O2 giving H2O plus O2, we had seen this in the combination reaction where H2O and oxygen had given you H2O2. Uh, then we had also looked at CaCO3 uh, giving Ca, uh, CaO and CO2 earlier. So this is just a reverse reaction of what we have seen earlier again. Uh, so you'll realize that uh, this is a decomposition reaction where a uh, 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 a, a complex compound is actually giving two simpler compounds. Uh, here is one reaction where a complex compound is actually giving elemental forms. So uh, there are multiple reactions that you can see, uh, you know, which are of the form of decomposition reactions. Now let's look at the uh, third uh, major type, which is the displacement reaction. Uh, sometimes it's also called as single displacement reactions. Uh, so when we see, uh, when we are talking about single displacement reactions, only one element displaces another one in the compound. Uh, so you'll have a general form of A plus BC giving AC plus B. Uh, the, the, the way that you write these reactions is, uh, you know, you actually, uh, you know, so if, let's say someone asks you, uh, write the properties of a decomposition reaction. Uh, it's, it's a good idea to mention that they have a general form of A plus BC giving AC plus B. Uh, you'll realize that in this, in this scenario, you'll find that ele one element and a compound gives another element and a compound. Okay, so please note that element is something that is very critical in this uh, scenario. You will find that zinc uh, with AgNO3 is giving you Ag plus ZnO3. So here you will find that uh, one metal is displacing other uh, metal from the compound. Okay, so these are these are the uh, important factors that we have uh, in displacement reaction. 
now uh, let's look at uh, some some more uh, uh, forms uh, for example in in the same displacement reaction uh, when we have single displacement reaction we have a plus bx giving ax plus b one element and one compound are basically get exchanging uh, one more element type now most of these are generally ionic compounds that's a very important thing that we need to uh, really look at that most of them are uh, of the ionic form uh, now let's look at uh, uh, some more examples uh, in in single displacement reactions what really guides this entire uh, process is the reactivity series uh, we will be looking at reactivity series again in uh, you know metals and non metals uh, but uh, you know just for your understanding i have put it here as well uh, i have also given you an acronym to really remember that uh, so one of the acronyms that i am putting on the screen is please stop calling me a careless zebra instead try learning how copper saves gold so uh, if you really look at the first letters of this entire sentence you will find that potassium sodium calcium magnesium aluminum is the generally there is a confusion between the carbon here and copper so please note that carbon is always on top of copper and uh, calcium is the topmost so when you say call and car uh, you know that's something that will give you a hint of uh, you know it's it's calcium and carbon okay so don't make mistakes when you write calcium carbon and copper uh, calcium is at the topmost of the reactivity series then there is carbon and then there is copper at the bottom okay uh, now also another common mistake is uh, sodium is you know s is not really recognized directly as sodium uh, generally the first thing that comes to our mind is na but please note that s is sodium here of course i mean this is something that is uh, not really mistaken that commonly but the bottom one is silver uh, in fact there is platinum and gold below uh, platinum and uh, palladium below gold that also you can really uh, look at so in all single displacement reactions someone who is more reactive uh, displaces someone who is less reactive so for example in this scenario you can see that mg and cuso4 we are talking about so mg is above copper uh, so therefore mg will displace copper and remain in the solution please note that anyone who is higher in the reactivity series uh, would love to be in the aqueous form so this is a this is a, a a trick that i can share with you is that anyone who is in the uh, higher in the priority would love to remain in the aqueous form and when i say in the aqueous form basically in the salt form so if if someone has to stay in the salt form it has to form a compound and really uh, uh, you know displace the other uh, element so copper is actually deposited in in this equation uh, which is a single displacement reaction uh, uh, so uh, this 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 uh, reactivity series is something that you will need to memorize uh, and hence i have put in a, uh, an acronym also for you uh, which which you can you know make use of now there will be predictive questions that can be asked to you so as to say that uh, you know predict whether or not this reaction will occur uh, predict what will be the products so for example you know cl2 plus ki uh, whether this will happen or not so you will realize that cl2 plus ki does react to give kcl plus i2 okay in this scenario you will find that iodine is displaced by chlorine uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, so basically potassium will stay in the uh, uh, in the form of uh, uh, product uh, because potassium is actually a very highly reactive uh, element so whether it is metals uh, uh, all metals uh, replace other metals or hydrogen and there could be non metals which replace non metals as well so all of these are important remember when uh, simply it is given with acid or water you will realize that metals will give out uh, displacing all the hydrogens in the series so so this is a quick uh, look at single displacement reactions uh, now let's look at double displacement reactions the the basic principle of displacement remains the same whether it is single displacement or double displacement uh, the idea here is but that two compounds react and two compounds basically end up exchanging uh, you know atoms between themselves so for example ab plus cd has been given ad plus cd so the general form of this reaction is written here uh, so a couple of points that you can write when you are asked a question about uh, what kind of reaction is this is that firstly you can write the definition you can write as general form you can also write it uh, in terms of elements and compounds and then the last one could be an example uh, sometimes you also can write a reason around it for example you can mention that uh, the reactivity series is what is followed during this uh, 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 displacement reactions and therefore uh, the compounds uh, or elements end up displacing someone else from the reaction so that's that's a quick uh, look at a double displacement reaction uh, let's also look at what kind of compounds actually form uh, double displacement reaction so you'll realize that it mostly has to be an i uh, you know ionic uh, compounds of two different uh, compounds that uh, exchange ions between them uh, 
yes uh, so uh, ruchir is asking is non metal replacement also called as displacement reaction yes it is called ruchir anywhere any element is displaced so anything that has a form of a plus uh, bc giving ab plus c uh, is a displacement reaction okay so remember the form the form is core to any displacement reactions so uh, yeah so that that answers your question now coming back to our double displacement reaction you'll find that atoms or ions from two different compounds can replace each other uh, and of course how do we identify that there are two compounds as reactants and two compounds as products so this is always one of the key factors when you whenever you look at double displacement reaction uh, i have mentioned a example here which is caco3 plus hcl uh, giving caocl2 uh, plus uh, uh, sorry caco3 plus hcl giving cacl2 plus h2co3 so this is one common example uh, you'll realize that your uh, calcium has replaced hydrogen uh, uh, and taken over chlorine so it becomes cacl2 and co3 has gone with hydrogen to form h2co3 so this is an example of double displacement reaction now let's look at uh, a few more uh, important reactions yeah uh, agno3 plus hcl giving agcl plus hno3 so this is another important reaction that uh, uh, we have uh, you know uh, mentioned so you will find that uh, the silver is actually going with chlorine now whereas hydrogen takes in with no3 now another common mistake that people do is they don't realize that which are the uh, elements that you should actually have to form uh, uh, you know the uh, compounds so for example uh, you know whether it should be agn or o3 so with practice i think uh, now with the amount of examples that we have done uh, so uh, uh, all of that uh, should not be a problem but just in case if you are ever in doubt always know that you should look out for cations and anions so for example when i'm talking about agno3 i'm actually talking about ag plus plus no3 minus okay so when we are talking about cations and anions you will realize that uh, you will be able to really have uh, a clear idea as to what exchanges should i be really looking at okay similarly in fe2o3 you will realize that it is the ion and chlorine which can go together and oxygen and hydrogen can go together right so these are a few more examples of double displacement reaction uh, what are the conditions of double displacement reactions uh, most of these reactions uh, will not occur unless they are dissolved in water okay uh, because uh, the dissolution in water actually gives you uh, an ability to separate the ions so if you are able to separate the ions uh, you will realize that uh, double displacement reaction is more prone uh, then uh, reactions are more likely to take place if one product is molecular compound uh, or precipitate or gas okay so this is one more uh, I, this is just a trick that i'm i'm sharing with you that how to really identify whether a double displacement reaction will occur or not so in the products if one of them is actually a molecular compound what, when i say a molecular compound it means uh, either it is a very stable covalent compound uh, or it is a precipitate or it is a gas okay so in any of these scenarios you will realize that uh, you you will have uh, you know the double displacement reactions going forward very easily i'm going to compare this with our example that we have seen so far to explain you so for example you'll realize that agcl is a precipitate here so in this scenario this agcl is going to get uh, into the solid state uh, similarly fecl3 is also a precipitate and it will be into the solid state so this is one key to understand that double displacement reaction is possible let me give you one more uh, when you really look at uh, cseo3 plus hcl uh, CaCl2 is a precipitate, but H2CO3 also and further decomposes into H2O plus CO2. So CO2 gas is released because CO2 gas is released. You know, let me write it for you. So uh, H2CO3 gives out further H2O plus CO2. So as CO2 gas is released, you will you will find out that uh, you know uh, the double displacement reaction is very prominent here. So most of the double displacement reactions will have. Either a gas or uh, you know a precipitate being released or put into the uh, you know system. Now let's look at uh, uh, a few more reactions. Uh, the next type of chemical reaction is combustion reaction. Now combustion reaction is uh, very similar to addition reactions. The only question is uh, that in combustion reaction oxygen definitely gets added. So uh, you know you will find that uh, in combustion reaction sometimes uh, you know a combustion reaction can have an addition happening. Uh, between them okay so an addition reaction is uh, sometimes a part of combustion reaction but not all combustion reactions uh, will be technically only a combination reaction when i say addition i'm talking about combination reactions okay so for example you'll realize that uh, in hydrocarbon plus oxygen giving carbon dioxide plus water uh, you will realize that 
uh, oxygen is getting combined with carbon and hydrogen both of them okay so uh, let me give you another example so for example uh, we have c2h6 uh, giving o2 the same reaction that i'm talking about co2 plus h2o okay so we have uh, carbon dioxide plus uh, water uh, getting released because of oxygen getting added to the hydrocarbon okay so this is the most commonly used combustion reaction you will find that this being mentioned in a lot many places uh, around uh, uh, the uh, you know around your text the second one is uh, you know with fluorine for example you know you can have the same c2h6 plus fluorine uh, fluorine gas you know you can say as f2 or f uh, giving you carbon fluoride which is cf4 okay plus uh, hydrogen fluoride which is hf okay so uh, these reactions are also sometimes mentioned in your text quite quite commonly so uh, the products of oxidation of hydrocarbons in normal conditions is carbon dioxide and water vapor okay so these are all combination rea combustion reactions so combustion reactions are a typical type of combination reactions okay so that's that's something that you can actually really look at now uh, let's look at uh, some more examples for example you have this as uh, you know uh, carbon hydro uh, hydrogen sulfide uh, you find that when it reacts with fluorine it not only gives you carbon fluoride but also gives you hydrogen fluoride and sulfur fluoride uh, sulfur hexafluoride right so similarly here you are finding that methane with water is actually uh, and nitrogen is actually not only giving you co2 plus h2o but but also the nitrogen comes out back and heat uh, the nitrogen generally used here to actually keep the temperatures low or really have uh, a smooth reaction uh, within carbon uh, you know methane and uh, the oxygen molecule okay so this is these are a few examples of combustion please note the way the heat is written here so which means that as the products are produced uh, heat is given out okay uh, the next is uh, not but not all of the reactions that you will encounter in your chemistry syllabus even in the next four chapters which we will look in a few days are actually uh, of the four types so they uh, you know uh, some of them actually uh, uh, are uh, for example you know uh, also redox reactions some are neutralization reactions there are multiple classifications that we look at but these five classifications are very prominent in your first chapter that you need to know about in terms of their definition their examples their form and uh, uh, you know their principle their reason why they they write so i'm going to write these five points for you on on this so anytime that any of these reactions are asked to you the first thing that you need to do is you need to write its definition as the first point the second point you need to write it as the general form that it has for example i've given you all the general forms uh, of these reactions the third thing that you can actually write is uh, uh, you know the reason that they do for example you know either it is a reactivity series or uh, it is simply uh, because of oxygen getting combined so all of that uh, the reason is very important the fourth you can always write is as an example of this chemical reaction uh, so uh, and and uh, you know balance the examples pretty well to write the chemical equations of all of these right so these are the four major points that you can always write for any of these examples of chemical reactions now let's look at uh, uh, the other types of uh, mentions in your text so for example redox reaction is something that has been mentioned uh, uh, quite commonly in your textbook uh, so what is a redox reaction a redox reaction is a combination of oxidation and re reduction reaction happening together uh, in simple terms what is an oxidation an oxidation is where uh, you know oxygen is added oxygen is added or hydrogen is removed okay or hydrogen is removed so this is the most common definition of oxidation uh, now whenever an oxidation happens in a reaction reduction has to happen of course when someone gets oxidized only then something will get reduced uh, there is a question by param who says uh, sir if the nitrogen isn't reacting uh, why do you need 7n2 and not just n2 uh, that's right param uh, the uh, uh, the the answer for that question is basically uh, the nitrogen here is just being uh, used as a coolant uh, why 7 nitrogen because that's the proportion of gases that you generally keep in the container so as to have an effective uh, you know uh, a transfer of heat so not that the nitrogen is a part of the reaction uh, uh, you know uh, i wouldn't recommend that you really uh, uh, you know really pick this up as a as a very special example but i would just say that you know it's basically a ratio of gases that is being used uh, so as to there is a effective transfer of heat uh, between them uh, it uh, isn't it acting as a catalyst no it's not acting as a catalyst uh, it's simply acting as a coolant uh, in the in the reaction so uh, we don't need any catalyst to burn methane uh, it's just simply a coolant uh, so coming back to our uh, uh, you know uh, answering that question we come back to our definition of redox reactions so in redox reactions you will find that 
uh, one of them actually undergoes oxidation while the other goes reduction. So you'll realize that in CuO, here is getting reduced because oxygen is getting removed from CuO to give you uh, copper. So this is an uh, reduction reaction, whereas hydrogen is one which is giving, getting an oxygen. So this is an oxidation reaction. Now, when both oxidation and reduction are happening together, uh, you'll realize that uh, this reaction is called as a redox reaction. The very word redox comes from uh, red and uh, ox, which means reduction happening uh, with oxygen uh, to oxidation together. So, so that's that's the way that uh, this this works. Uh, Sai Vidya is saying, sir, in the reaction Cu plus O2, uh, there is only oxidation. Uh, well, no, Sai, uh, uh, Sai you know, you, basically uh, the hydrogen taking in oxygen is also termed as oxidation. Okay, uh, so this is very well an oxidation. Uh, uh, I know the common question that might be coming to your mind is, uh, sir, but uh, isn't hydrogen also getting added to there? So how do we call it as oxidation? See, technically, when uh, CuO gets reduced, uh, the one that makes it get reduced will get oxidized. So what for uh, you know where we call this as reducing agent or oxidizing agent. So if I have to really look at hydrogen here is our reducing agent for CuO because H2 is reducing CuO to give you Cu, whereas uh, uh, you know, if you really look at CuO, it is the oxidizing agent for H2 because it is actually giving hydrogen and oxygen to get, get oxidized. So we will we will mention this as uh, uh, oxidation of hydrogen, whereas reduction of CuO. Uh, yes. So the above reaction, yes, eventually uh, 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 gets uh, CuO. That's right. Yes. So, uh, uh, yes, so, so, so you're right, Sai, uh, you know, so that, uh, as I mentioned, you know, yeah, eventually as uh, copper gets uh, reduced, it uh, ends up getting copper uh, and uh, uh, hydrogen gets uh, oxidized to water. So, so that's, that's a part of uh, redox reactions. If you have any questions on this, please shoot it out on the uh, chat window and I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, let's look at uh, two, the last part of our uh, chapter, which is uh, 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 parts of corrosion and uh, rancidity in other 10 minutes i'll be taking up a free discussion on all the questions that you have on this chapter uh, once we finish this presentation uh, so the the last two parts of this chapter is corrosion uh, which is uh, special definitions that have been mentioned in uh, in in your in your syllabus uh, the idea of corrosion is it's the process in which metals uh, are slowly eaten up by the action of air moisture or chemicals Okay, now please note, uh, uh, we have explicitly mentioned here air, moisture and chemicals. For example, rusting is a form of corrosion. Now, rusting is just one form of corrosion. Uh, Vikas is asking, uh, sir, are neutralization reactions, redox reactions? Because no, in fact, in neutralization reactions, there is simply double displacement reactions. So, uh, we, have, we have seen this earlier as well. I'm going to give you an example. For example, if you really see uh, any uh, OH plus our very common example of HCl, giving uh, you know NaCl plus H2O uh, you see in in this scenario no one is getting uh, uh, you know removed of only oxygen or only hydrogen when you are taking out OH from sodium you are taking out oxygen as well as hydrogen uh, from chlorine uh, you are actually taking out uh, uh, you know hydrogen and putting up another electropositive element so that's really again not a reduction so uh, neutralization reactions uh, may not be redox reactions okay uh, uh, so there, there could be a few cases where they might uh, have oxidation reduction happening, but in general, uh, it's not a thumb rule that all neutralization are reductions. So not necessary. Uh, yeah, coming back to our uh, corrosions. Uh, so corrosion basically is a process where metals are eaten up slowly uh, by the action of air, moisture, and chemicals. For example, rusting is a form of corrosion in which iron is eaten up. Uh, okay, so this is one corrosion uh, where uh, you know we only talk about iron. Uh, for example, we also have corrosion of aluminum where aluminum oxides are getting formed. We have corrosion of silver where uh, silver halides or silver oxides also are getting formed. So those are different types of corrosions. Rusting typically is a type of corrosion where we speak about iron uh, and the action of air, moisture, uh, you know, also uh, reddish brown coating of iron oxide is formed. Uh, okay, so remember the color, the color is important uh, of iron oxide. Uh, the, the reaction for iron uh, rusting is given generally in terms of Fe2O3, uh, as as is mentioned in your text. Uh, please, you know, I, I've also seen people writing Fe plus, uh, you know, oxygen uh, giving FeO. Okay. Uh, ideally, this is not really a, a wrong equation, but uh, I would recommend that you stick to the Fe 
uh, plus 3H2O2, Fe2O3 plus 3H2 reaction. Uh, this is because iron is most stable in its highest oxidation state, which is plus 3, so where it actually forms Fe2O3. So this is the recommended reaction to write for corrosion, especially rusting of iron. Uh, and uh, whenever you write example, please take a note of this as well. Now, uh, how do we really avoid corrosion? Uh, we have discussed multiple methods, but I'm going to talk about four most prominent methods uh, that are important for you. One is painting of metal surfaces. So we paint with an uh, with, with either an oil paint or something that can cut the contact of the metal from air. So this is this, the idea here is to, uh, you know, the contact has to be uh, lost with the moisture or air uh, uh, so that the rusting is avoided. Second is we do powdered coating of surfaces. So basically what we are doing is uh, we are putting in uh, either uh, some ceramic material or, or we put in some uh, other element which can uh, which can also be uh, you know coated on other elements uh, uh, so that you know they actually lose the contact with uh, uh, you know the, with, with the air or with moisture and therefore rusting is avoided now uh, the other uh, important thing is we can oil the metal surfaces so this is something that we also do for example uh, in our bicycles when we put grease or oil on the chain uh, one of the reasons is to really lubricate it but one one also important reason is to actually keep them from rusting because rusting are going to make uh, their strength weak uh, their, their the chain uh, is going to get weaker and therefore it will be useless after of, uh, after a certain amount of time so that's that's a uh, oiling method for metal surfaces uh, the last method is galvanization uh, this is actually applying uh, a protective layer of zinc uh, over iron or steel uh, there are two reasons for this uh, one reason is of course zinc being more reactive than most of the metals it sacrifices itself uh, when it comes to rusting okay so it will sacrifice itself and not let the metal really uh, uh, you know get weakened uh, so that is one reason the second reason is of course when zinc uh, coating is there on iron or steel uh, it is the zinc which is in touch with the moisture and the iron and steel uh, are are actually avoided uh, uh, a contact with moisture so of course uh, this is the common reason that why we do any kind of electroplating for that matter so these are the two reasons that we do galvanization for uh, and uh, yeah, so so this is one. Then uh, coming back, so there is a question from Sai, sir. Can you explain even after the zinc coating is broken, the article is still resistant to corrosion? Is it something to do with oxidation of zinc? I just mentioned uh, Sai uh, about that. So even after you break the zinc coating, uh, the article is still resistant to corrosion uh, because uh, uh, you have just broken the zinc coating. But uh, unless you have really taken out zinc out of it, uh, uh, you know, zinc will be the one that will be the first. Uh, to uh, you know take away any any moisture that is there so h2o or oxygen or uh, any other gaseous uh, impurity that is going to come in and the reason for this is zinc is more reactive than any uh, than most of the metals you know most of the metals which are solid for example iron steel uh, you know in in that scenario zinc will sacrifice itself uh, against any of these metals so when we say that the uh, you know the coating is broken uh, it, it, we we don't mean that the coating is completely removed the question simply means that you know let's say you have a metal container and everything was coated with zinc but now you have a gap in it okay so even when there is a gap and if there is moisture that is now touching the inner metal element uh, why is the metal not getting corroded and the reason for that is even if moisture is com uh, coming in and the metal is wanting to have a reaction uh, it is zinc who will react faster than the metal and uh, you will find that zinc will sacrifice itself uh, to protect the metal covering so that's the reason for uh, zinc being used quite often to uh, you know coat uh, very highly sensitive uh, instruments uh, especially iron instruments and uh, uh, it saves the iron from getting corroded further all right so so that's a quick uh, uh, you know uh, uh, recap on uh, corrosion uh, let's look at rancidity now uh, rancidity is uh, happen uh, you know rancidity basically happens when uh, substances food substances mostly which contains oils and fats when they are exposed to air they get oxidized and uh, when they get oxidized, they end up giving out foul smell. Uh, their taste also changes. Uh, sometimes it's bitter. Sometimes it's uh, simply pale tasting, uh, stale tasting. And that, that's, that's also the word uh, stale comes from. Uh, and there is also a color change. A classic example is apples and bananas. Uh, when, they, when they turn rancid, they actually are unedible. Uh, so, uh, 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 so, this is, this is, so how we define rancidity is, uh, when substances containing oils and fats are exposed to air, uh, they basically get oxidized and uh, they form 
uh, uh, you know, tasteless, uh, uh, foul smelling and colored substances. This process is called as rancidity. Please note, uh, the process is rancidity, okay? And the objects are rancid objects. So when rancidity is mentioned, do not say that apple is rancidity. You know, I've, I've, I've read these answers. Uh, that's wrong. You know, the process is rancidity. What substance is formed as a, is called as a rancid substance, okay? Uh, uh, one of the examples that I have mentioned here is when butter is kept open for a long time, it starts smelling and its taste changes. So that's also one of the uh, reasons that, uh, uh, you know, we, we keep butter either in a refrigerator or uh, it's covered, okay? So that's that's rancidity. Now, how do we avoid rancidity? Uh, rancidity can be again avoided by uh, a couple of methods, five different methods I have mentioned here. Uh, one is that uh, it can definitely be uh, prevented uh, uh, through antioxidants. Uh, which means that substances which prevent oxidation of food. Uh, okay, uh, so that's that's one. Uh, the second is uh, uh, it. Uh, you know, you can also store this in airtight containers where uh, air does not come in and uh, really uh, mess up with the food substance. So you will find that uh, uh, you put them in airtight containers, and this 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 avoids the uh, process. It may not completely avoid, but it slows down the process of uh, rancidification. Uh, it's called as rancidification uh, and uh, uh, you can you can have a longer shelf life of the food products when i say shelf life it means how long can i store a food product without any external support uh, but if you need to take an external support then uh, refrigeration is the best idea to go for so you put in refrigerators uh, uh, which also slows down the process of rancidification uh, uh, if you cool it at the right temperatures you can really delay rancidification for a very long time uh, and uh, uh, the last one is to replace oxygen in the containers with another gas. For example, you can you can use nitrogen gas. Uh, you know, any inert gas would would be sufficient. But you know, uh, technically using directly inert gases is not really feasible. So therefore, nitrogen is the best one, uh, which is quite inert and uh, can be used in multiple uh, uh, you know uh, uh, usages and and can can help us in storing these substances for a for a very long time. <coughs> so these are the different ways four different ways uh, as to how do you really avoid rancidity. Um, yeah, so that, that brings us to the end of uh, our revision on this chapter. And we have covered all the important points as well as we have seen. How do we how do we do answer writing? And uh, we solve all, all of these uh, numericals and questions. Uh, now, uh, I would like to take in uh, the questions that you might have on any of these uh, topics. Okay, so I can, I can answer you uh, all of them now. Uh, please feel free to post your questions, uh, or I'll uh, you know uh, uh, I'll be happy to take them one on one as well uh, if required. Yeah, yeah. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to mention them uh, on uh, on the topic. Yeah. Yes, so Param says, why does refrigeration delay rancidity? Uh, good question, Param. Uh, so firstly, for any chemical reaction to happen, uh, having a minimum amount of energy is very important, okay? So let's take an example. Let's take the oxidation example itself. So let's say you have a compound which is ethyl alcohol, and this alcohol gets oxidized. When, when I write this in oxygen, it means that it is getting oxidized to, let's say, CH3, C, uh, COOH, okay, which is, so when ethyl alcohol is oxidized, it ends up giving acetic acid. Now, this oxidation basically happens because uh, uh, some bonds are broken. Of course, the CH bonds in uh, ethyl alcohol are broken and new bonds are formed between carbon and oxygen. Now, uh, the, the question here is to break these bonds, I need some amount of energy. So, uh, uh, what we essentially do is uh, uh, when refrigeration, we are bringing down that energy of the particles. And when we bring down this energy, uh, the reaction is not feasible uh, in the same amount of uh, rigorousness that uh, it is needed. So uh, any reaction happens because of collisions, right? So when these oxygen atoms would collide with these particles, uh, they need certain amount of speed, kinetic energy, so that they can actually knock off these hydrogens or break these bonds and then get converted into an acetic acid molecule. But uh, in our situation, when we are refrigerating it, we basically are taking away temperature from them, which means we are we are trying to take away the thermal energy. Uh, and as we take out thermal energy, their kinetic energy is also reduced. So the collisions are 
uh, which result into a change of uh, reactants to products are lesser and therefore uh, reaction slows down. Uh, now, please note that this is not the case for uh, uh, you know exothermic reactions. So if you have an if you have a reaction which is actually giving out heat and getting more stable, uh, if you bring down the temperature, these reactions get accelerated. Uh, why does that happen? Uh, that happens because uh, the reaction is more favorable when there are low temperatures because the reaction themselves is giving out heat. So if if the surrounding is not opposing uh, their uh, their expulsion of heat, uh, then they are more comfortable in giving out uh, energy. But if the surrounding itself has a high amount of energy, then the surrounding is going to suppress uh, the evolution of heat for them. So this is this is a separate topic from what what your question is. But the idea is that uh, the refrigeration process really works for those uh, compounds which are actually uh, endothermic, you know, which which need energy to really uh, go forward, right? So if you don't need energy to go forward, refrigeration does not help, you know. Uh, uh, to give you uh, some examples is that you have seen that you know some of the food particles even after after refrigerating uh, do not stay for that long you know uh, a classic example is actually flesh you know uh, you will find that uh, vegetables and themselves still have some amount of uh, shelf life but flesh and all actually you know uh, uh, sometimes uh, some some amount of flesh actually uh, degrades faster than uh, you know even even a few vegetables for example potatoes and all so, uh, so, so yeah, different substances have different uh, abilities to react in terms of the energies that are required. Yeah, so that's uh, that's one question. Uh, maybe any other questions that you might have? Yeah, please keep on shooting. Since there is a small time lag between what you type and what where where I answer, so it's a good idea to actually keep and uh, keep the type questions uh, out there on the chat window so that uh, once I've answered a particular question, then uh, you know I'm free to take up the new one. Sir, is refrigeration also because of bacteria? Uh, uh, what do you mean by that, Rushir? You're, you're saying that bacteria, uh, uh, the, the bacterial action is suppressed because of refrigeration. Uh, if if that's your question, then the answer is yes. Uh, again, but the point there is the same. You know, even for bacteria to do a chemical reaction, need energy, uh, need uh, at least some amount of uh, you know, kinetic uh, uh, energy for the molecules to combine. So what basically bacteria do is they end up secreting some chemicals uh, which help the reaction. But uh, the other the other thing is also for bacteria to really, uh, you know, survive, there is certain amount of temperature that is needed. But uh, if you really drop the temperature, then bacteria cannot survive in that, in that temperature or less amount of temperature can uh, really be detrimental for bacterial action. So yes, that actually uh, can be can be something that does not help, uh, you know, uh, their their action on the uh, chemical substances, and therefore uh, rancidity can be avoided. Yes, so that's that's uh, one reason. So that's true. Okay, uh, right. So any other questions that you might have? Uh, uh, if not, I would like to give you a couple of questions. Uh, so, but I would I would like to wait for because more than me testing you, this is a time where. Uh, if you if you have really practiced and if you have anything to ask about, uh, you know you can actually ask us. Uh, ask up, yeah. <clears throat> Good. So, uh, yeah. So since I don't see any more questions coming in, uh, I would recommend you guys to you know have your textbooks handy. Uh, and just skim through them. If you if you feel that there's anything that you need to ask, you can ask that. Uh, but if there's nothing, then what I would do is uh, I would I would like to give you some questions myself. Uh, here's a quick question, an easy one, but uh, maybe I just would like to, you guys to really write it. So I'm going to write this as uh, a borane. When so this is a, this is a word equation. Uh, the question is, uh, Param, I would I would suggest that you know we we just discuss about. Uh, chemical equations and chemical reactions for today. Uh, if you have a question, you are most welcome to put it out on the, uh, you know, personally to me on WhatsApp, maybe after the session. Uh, but for the time being, you know, I would like to focus on chemical reactions. If it is connected to the topic, I would be happy to take it up. Uh, yeah, so let me write you a question uh, for here. Uh, so uh, when borane is put in water, borane is put in water, B-O-R-A-N-E, uh, is put in water, uh, it gives out boric acid and hydrogen gas and hydrogen gas. Uh, uh, the question is, 
please write a balanced chemical equation uh, in entirety for this uh, uh, this expression, this word equation. Uh, I'll wait for a, a, about 30 seconds and I would I would be happy to uh, really look at your answers in the chat window. Yeah, so while uh, others are, are really looking at uh, uh, the solution for this, uh, I'll be uh, answering Param's question. So yeah, meanwhile, I think people are also trying this. Yes. So till others are attempting. Yeah, that's why Ruchi Rai asked this question. So yeah, just try and attempt. I know that you might not know the chemical formula of a few compounds, but that's the reason that I wanted to give this question. So try and try and attempt this. Uh, I'll give you a solution in a few minutes. Okay, so Sai says BH3 plus H2O giving H2 plus BH2O3. Uh, that's a good attempt, Sai. I think you have got uh, half of it right, uh, but but you've made a small mistake. Uh, but we'll look at that. We'll look at that in a few minutes. Yeah, so that's a good idea. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to share this solution with you because uh, I imagine, yeah, I imagine that you guys are slightly uh, behind me in terms of this so recording. So. So borane actually is BH3 and diborane is B2H6, okay? Diborane is B2H6 and BH3 is borane, okay? Generally, borane exists as diborane, okay? I mean, commonly in, in, uh, in, in the chemical world. But if they have given you borane, it's, uh, it's, uh, you should take BH3. So BH3 plus H2O, uh, when you say boric acid, it is actually H3BO3. So Sai, uh, you, you are given a right good answer. But instead of, uh, uh, you know, H H3BO3, you mentioned H2BO3, which is uh, slight, slightly different, uh, plus H2, okay? So this is, this is the, uh, now H3BO3 is aqueous, obviously, and uh, you have H2O liquid, and uh, you have BH3, uh, you know, uh, diborane is actually gaseous in nature. So I'm going to write BH3 also gaseous, okay? So I'm going to choose this as the gaseous form. Now, let's understand how to balance this. Now you realize that the OH is all the time getting displaced. You'll find that probably it's already balanced. Okay, so there is three hydrogens here, two hydrogens here, five in total. Again, five hydrogens, one boron, and oxygen is just not balanced. So oxygen is yet to be balanced. So I can I can really put three here. So the moment I put three here, I will put another three here. So now let's see. This is six H two. Uh, there is six H two. Three hydrogen oxygens are balanced. Uh, boron is balanced. Uh, and so this is, uh, yeah, so this is 6 plus 3, 9. Uh, there is another 6 plus 3, 9. And so I, everything seems to be balanced now. So borane is BH3. This is water. This is H3BO3, uh, which is boric acid, and H2, which is hydrogen. Good. Now, uh, let me give you one more question on balancing the chemical reactions. Uh, let's say if, uh, iron oxide, iron 3 oxide, Fe2O3, or uh, plus carbon monoxide okay predict the products predict the products and balance the chemical equation so this could this could be a bit simpler uh, see if you are able to predict the products and balance this chemical equation i'll pause for a few uh, minutes once one one more time
Yes, so how many of you have got this? Can you please post your solutions in the comment box? Okay, so it seems a few of you have attempted it already. Let me see. Okay. So I'm going to give you an answer for this. Uh, so this actually ends up giving Fe metal. So please remember whenever CO is a part of the, uh, of, of, of the uh, uh, you know, equation, CO will always end up going to CO2, okay? Uh, CO is a very good reducing agent and it ends up going to CO2. Yeah, so Param has got it right. Ishan has, uh, Ishan, you've, uh, it's not iron oxide, it's actually iron plus CO2. Okay, so I'm going to give you this uh, reaction that is Fe2CO3 plus CO gives Fe plus CO2. Uh, yeah, now the only thing that, yeah, perfect. I think Shubham has already balanced it uh, and Shubham has got it right as well. Uh, okay, Shubham, that's perfect. Uh, so you end up getting Fe2O3 plus thrice of CO gives twice of Fe plus thrice of CO2. Very good. I think that's a that's a that's a good answer. Uh, yes, Shuvams is correct. Uh, and uh, uh, Param, I think you've just uh, uh, not balanced it. I think rest was right. Uh, Ishan, FeO is not the product. Uh, when CO is present, CO will generally try to take out everything, uh, every oxygen bit. If you remember, uh, CO is also used. Not just CO, but carbon is also used in the smelting process, which we have seen in metals. Okay, so uh, the very reason that we use the smelting process is because carbon actually uh, really, uh, uh, you know, make uh, carbon carbon actually uh, takes out every oxygen that is possible and makes things happen. Okay, so uh, Fe2O3 plus thrice of CO uh, gives twice of Fe and uh, three CO2. That's correct. Six and six, yeah. So oxygens are balanced, carbon is balanced, and iron as well is balanced. Perfect. I think that's a that's a right answer. Now uh, let me ask you one more question. Okay. Uh, let's say, uh, hmm. okay. So uh, I I'm going to ask you a multiple choice question, and uh, uh, you know uh, try and try and uh, answer these uh, questions. Okay, uh, as much as possible. So here is a re reaction which I am giving you. Cu plus XHNO3 okay, uh, gives CuNO3 twice plus Y times NO2 plus twice of H2O. Okay. Uh, your uh, your uh, uh, question is what are the values of x comma y what are the values of x comma y so try and get these values uh, a sap and, and and let's see uh, you know what values do you arrive at Okay, <clears throat> so Sai mentioned some answer. Let's see about others.
Okay, so now Sai thinks probably is just not is still wanting to try. Let's see. Okay, so a lot of people have given the answer. That's right. It's four and two. You're correct. So let's look at how it really works, right? Now, uh, one good idea of this question is that they have already given you a balanced hydrogen. If they would have not given you hydrogen balanced, then it would have been a much more difficult question. But the moment hydrogen is balanced, the idea is that X has to become four, okay? Because there is no other hydrogen component that is there in the reactant side. So, and there is only one hydrogen component on the product side. So this definitely has to be four. Now, the moment this becomes four, uh, let's see what really happens to nitrogen. You see nitrogen are four here. There are There is only two nitrogen here. So definitely this has to be two. Now, when we take this as two, let's see whether we are able to balance oxygen, which is the key question that we have to answer. Copper is already balanced. Here we have 12 oxygen on this side. Now, on this side, we have six oxygen here. Now, we need six more oxygen. When we write this as two, we only end up getting four oxygen here. But there are another two oxygens that come in from this side and therefore this ends up again to be equal to 12 oxygen. Please note, had this two not been given, this would have been a tougher problem. So maybe in the next question, I would, I would try and really keep this also as a hidden one. But let's see what, you know, uh, how, how this really evolves. Now, uh, good. So a good answer. I think everyone could get this. This is, a, uh, this is a good attempt by all. Okay. Now, let me give you one more question. Now, here's a question that I'm going to ask you, uh, and uh, please note that uh, I'm going to mention this verbally, so please pay attention. Uh, which of the following statements is not correct, okay? So I want which statements is not true or not correct, okay? Now, the first is, chemical equation tells us about the substances involved in a reaction, okay? So it is talking about chemical reactions, and it tells us about substances that are chemical reactions, substances that are involved in reaction okay substances involved okay so this is the first statement the second statement is uh, and please note this might this is a multiple correct option so it, one might be correct all all three might be correct answer please note you have to find which is not true okay now the next is a chemical equation informs us about the symbols and formula of substances involved in a reaction so it is it is, it is saying that chemical equation informs us about the symbols uh, the symbols as well as the formula, the formula of substances involved in the reaction. That is point B. Okay. Point C is a chemical equation tells us about the atoms, atom or molecules of the reactants and products involved in a reaction. So they are saying a chemical equation tells us about the atom slash molecules of reactants and products involved in the chemical reaction of reactants and products involved in the chemical reaction and the last option is a chemical equation represents energy changes it represents energy changes in the chemical reaction in the chemical reaction okay now please think guys this is quite close okay i am asking you which of this is not true I'm going to repeat all the four statements. There are some keywords that I've written on your screen. Please think about it and answer wisely. The first is chemical reaction, a chemical equation tells us about, so this is a small correction here. This is chemical equations that, that they, are talk, they are talking about. Chemical equations tells us about the substances involved in a reaction. The second one is chemical equation informs us about the symbols and formula of substances involved in the reaction. The third one is chemical equations tells us about the atom or molecules of the reactants and products involved in a chemical reaction. And the fourth one is a chemical re equation represents energy changes during a reaction. So you have to tell me which one of this is false or not true.
okay so i am getting some answers so a few of you are saying sir d and c not correct c is false i think four is not necessarily true four is all that you are talking about someone someone is saying that c is also not true okay any other answers okay <laughs> Okay, so the answer can energy changes be related to physical states? That's that's right, Sai. But uh, in energy changes, we are actually trying to understand what is the amount of energy released, how fast it is released, uh, by how many substances. So to give you, I think most of you have uh, actually uh, uh, you know guessed this. So this definitely is wrong. Okay, so it definitely does not tell you. It it can tell you whether heat is released or not, but how much heat, how fast. Uh, by how many substances all that is not mentioned so energy changes in a chemical reaction definitely a chemical equation does not represent now let's look at the others does the chemical equation tell us about the atom or molecules of the reactants and products involved in the in reaction no it does not please note it does not why the reason is unless we write it in the ionic form for example na plus plus cl minus i don't even know whether na and cl are covalently bonded or they are uh, you know ionically bonded so it does not talk about any atoms per se it does talk about molecules but it does not talk about atoms so this option also is wrong okay so uh, pratyush says but sir energy has to be necessary in chemical change yeah that is right pratyush but as i mentioned uh, it we only talk very broadly we don't say whether 240 kilojoules and how fast it happened and uh, how was the form of energy change whether it was only heat or whether it was light or so there are multiple information that you can derive out of energy changes and not all that information is represented in the chemical equation so therefore d part definitely is not true yeah then vikas is saying sir but it tells us number of atoms yes you are right vikas but uh, the point is another few information about atoms is not set for example i gave you an example of nacl it tells you the number of atoms but the information is not complete right so when when we are saying that chemical equation tells us something it means that it should be a complete information right because the statement is incomplete without uh, we having uh, some information miss expression so therefore it, it tells us about molecules if you if you tell me that does it tell us about nacl whether it tells us about its state whether it tells us about uh, whether it was dissolved or not and what happened to it yes it does tell us about molecules but about atoms what is happening inside the molecule uh, we really do not have enough idea so the c c is also not really uh, uh, correct now uh, the the b1 chemical equation informs us about the symbols and formulae uh, sir what did the option say yeah so the option says this i am i am going to read the c option one more time a chemical equation tells us about the atom or molecules of the reactants and products involved in a reaction so it does not tell us about the atoms it definitely tells us about the molecules unless it is in the elemental form it does not talk about the atoms so there is some ambiguity that that we really uh, you know see in there okay so that's that's one more point uh, let's look at the b1 a chemical equation informs us about the symbols and formulae of substances involved in a reaction actually it's not chemical reaction which talks about formulae it is the formulae which talks about chemical reaction so it is the other way around okay so for example if 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 a reaction is written you know the very same reaction let's take nacl plus h2o hydrolysis of salt giving back naoh okay so this is called as the hydrolysis of salt reaction if this equation is written this equation is based on the formula but if i am getting the formula itself wrong if i write this nacl2 plus h2o then the chemical reaction does not help us in understanding anything about the formula okay if your formula are right chemical reaction will help us in understanding how the equations really changed so so to your surprise the option b also is not correct okay please understand this i'll i'll reread this and i'm going to explain you this one more time a chemical equation informs us about the symbols and formulae of substances involved in a reaction it is not the chemical equation who tells us it is the formulae who tells us about chemical equation so if if we have the formulae right then the chemical equation is right if i write any chemical equation tomorrow for example if i write this as nacl2 plus h2o2 giving something else uh, it's not going to tell me whether this is the symbol of uh, this is the molecular formula of any compound or not it might be absolutely wrong okay so so it's not the chemical equation which tells us it is the other way around 
the first one says the chemical equation tells us about the substances involved in a reaction which is true in chemical equations we do write the substance name so only first option is correct all the other three is is wrong you know and they it the, the answer is very close you know if you really observe this uh, uh, this discussion you will find that the answer was pretty close to understanding which was right and which was wrong so be very careful when you do all of these right now uh, uh, we are just nearing to the close of the time so i just want to pause here for another minute and i think uh, there is a good amount of discussion that we could do today uh, the similar sessions will be happening all over the entire month and we will be doing the entire crash course uh, for 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 the upcoming time uh, what i would like you to suggest uh, do is the schedule of the crash uh, you know this this uh, revision course is is being shared with you you know so i i suggest a couple of things that you should really look at before you you know attend these sessions one it's a good idea to send me your doubts beforehand okay so that i will compile them in the in the presentation presentation itself and do that the other thing is it's also a very good idea to study the topic and be ready for the topic because if you do that then uh, you know uh, uh, it would be it would be much more uh, uh, you know convenient for us to really you know share information and uh, it will be a kind of a much more reinforcement of what you have already studied so that's a very important point that you study the topic and attend these sessions uh, the third one is after the session happens please go and uh, solve all the previous year's question papers on this particular topic that we are doing please note that all of these sessions are happening not only for chemistry but also for physics uh, for maths so uh, if you are if you are attending the previous years question papers right after the sessions that is going to be the best method for you to really uh, consolidate on the complete understanding of all the topics of all the chapters so uh, I, I would be uh, very strongly recommending that you do that uh, you know the drive link is already shared with you uh, uh you know uh, by rohit sir tushar sir so uh, you know please feel free and use that uh, to your maximum benefit if you get stuck somewhere come back the last and most important point that i would like to mention is uh, i have been mentioning what errors happen and how to write model answers uh, also there will be uh, you know small videos that will be shared on youtube on problem solving please go through them and make sure that your answer writing ability improves i think this is a time where you have enough information with you but your answer writing ability is something that is very very important to go forward uh, uh rushil this this schedule is uh, actually uh, you know fixed not just for one section but it's across all the sections for multiple students so the schedule is kind of stringent where we'll have to do it the way that it has been planned uh, but having said that you know uh, you can always reach out for individual doubts now is the time that you study and you uh, you know you ask questions rather than just listening to uh, the lot of lot of theory around okay so uh, uh good guys i think uh, it it was a good session uh, feel free to stay connected feel free to you know ping any time that you need uh, and i'll be happy to you know answer your questions uh, whenever possible you know as an as and when time permits okay so uh, i look forward to seeing you again uh, uh, you know in the next session chemistry uh, till then uh, you have a good time and uh, study hard work hard all the very best to you uh, make maximum of of your time in the coming days Thank you so much uh, yeah stay well take care bye bye